am Marco Werman. This is Angelique Kijo, uh, extraordinary selection for the Visionary Leadership Award here at Arts and Ideas. Uh, if they had asked me who would I nominate, you would have been my first choice, too. Thank so you, congratulations so Thank uh, you, on this honor. Thank you. Thank you. We, we go back to 1990. Uh, I, I met you as, uh, I was an entry-level producer at the BBC in London. I had just come back from five years living in Togo and Burkina Faso. <laughs> and uh, in 1986, uh, some guys got into a pub in London and decided to call all the music from the rest of the world that wasn't Anglo or American, world music. Uh, some say it created a ghetto, but I gotta say Angelique Kijo has been one of the great beneficiaries of world music. Because I refuse to be in that ghetto. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> because she refuses. Uh, and um, I've had the pleasure to see you many times in concert since then. Um, w when I first met you, I, it was kind of remarkable because five years in West Africa, I had discovered Mbilia Bell, Chala Moana, Franco, the Zyko Langa Langa, the Congolese music, which is like huge, right? Um, you could find Zouk, Caribbean music in Absolutely. Togo and Benin, Absolutely. but it was hard to find your music. Mm -hmm. You'd find Don Williams or like, uh, you know, what's it, uh, Phil Collins before you'd find Angelique Kijo. Absolutely. So here I am at the Bush House at the BBC in London and Angelique strides in and she's cosmopolitan, she speaks French because Benin is a former French colony, she speaks English, she can cuss in like five different languages. <laughs> um, and I learned was... cursing in America, <laughs> <laughs> the taxi drivers, I have to tell you. And it was, you were unlike any musician I had thought about or encountered from the continent before. Um, and as I've thought about your career, uh, kind of preparing for this, and we've spoken many times, but it, it kind of struck me that it's really hard to separate you as a musical innovator who is constantly changing and your work as a social activist, which is also changing. Um, what came first? Well, what came first is um, my, as a child, my curiosity to know about the world in a bigger picture. And luckily, I realize this now that I'm an adult, but I uh, grew up in a household where I took everything for granted and questioning everybody all the time. But my mom and dad, both of them have been educated, so uh, my father was always my compass, and he's no longer here today, but he's always gonna be with me is my, um, my love for people, basically, that's what comes first. Because I've seen my mom and dad leaving everything when somebody asks for help. In the middle of cooking, my mom will leave. And you see my father go, how am I gonna eat? And my mom will go, you'll manage, boom, and she's done, to go help somebody. So we always scrabble, scrabble, and then do the food, and my father go, let me help your mother. And then he's gonna go, and then we go, okay, here, here goes the lunch. Here goes dinner, so what are you gonna do? So basically, that's where it started from because I asked questions. I wanted to know who my ancestor were, was. Where, and I wanted to know a lot of things through music. Everything comes through music all the time. So for me, the history of humankind is linked to music, basically. I learned about slavery through music because the first time I saw the album of Jimi Hendrix, I could not believe that he was African-American. And I never heard that word before I was nine years old. I never heard the word slave. I never heard descendant. I never heard none of those before. And when my grandmother started to explain it to me, I'm like, mm, she's losing it. So that's how all has started. <laughs> they have been always linked, basically. Your, your parents are educated, were educated, um, but on the ground in reality in Africa, it's not always very appropriate for a young person, a young woman, a girl oh. to speak up. So how did that work? I mean, who, who was telling Angelique, mind your business, sit down, children are meant to be uh, my seen father, and not heard? My father and mother was always like that. My father and mother said, if you don't tell us what is going on, how are we gonna help you? Speak up. We are your parents, we can't read your brain, we are not a magician, and we don't wanna do that. And one thing that I realized growing up is also, at a very early age, how my parents have set up the house rule for everybody. And you have been responsabilized very early. I mean, I started cooking, I was eight years old. And my father said, okay, this house of ours is gonna be a free zone speech, open to every kind of human being. He said that. that that's what he said. 
and we tried to put some doorbell. It lasts 24 hours. He smashed it out <laughs> because it's just like gling gong, gling gong, gling gong. And just get mad. I said, just let the door open to anyone in this world that won't have something to say to come and say it. There was never going to be any taboo subject at the exception of racism, xenophobia, and anti Semitism. My father had no patience for hate and no time for fear of violence. So he said, This out, those things never going to happen here. So I, as a child, I learned to deal with my time. In the morning, breakfast, I know I have to be there. Lunch, I have to be there. Dinner, I have to be there. What happened in between? You deal with it. And if you miss a dinner or a lunch, you're in trouble. Why, why was that important, to be there for a meal? Because my father wanted to regroup everybody during the meal to see if something is going on in school, if there is any issue that he needs to, to know, if there is something he needs to pay to, for him. To, because he is raising 10 children with one salary. Paying books, uniform, tutoring, whatever it is. So you need to tell him before, and then he sees if he has the money or if he has to take a loan and pay for it. So, and it's also the dinner time where they have the heated argument because I have a brother, he's all, he's, lo he's like so logical sometimes. And my father is like, logic is a good thing, but add your heart to it because you just don't, can't be stuck in that thing like that. So we'll be eating and my mom is like, oh, here they go. <laughs> And then he's going to be challenging my father, challenging everybody. But it was interesting because as a child, I learned how to, in those moments, to think fast and to make my brain function because my father always used to say, your brain is your ultimate weapon. Use it. Don't come back here and tell me you failed because you're black because that's the only time I'm going to raise a hand on you. I'm like, okay, dad. Your, your brain in that case is like Ferrari technology. It just gets faster and faster <laughs> with every passing year. You can go like 500 miles an hour pretty soon. Yeah, pretty much. I want to, uh, you know, it's like the video where we heard the girls in that classroom singing about Tonga, which by the way, that song is as fresh today as when it came out in the early 90s. It's still amazing. Um, you were telling me that one of those girls showed up with her dad. And I want you to tell that story and also compare what we saw in that video in that classroom to how things, and that was in Benin, yeah. yeah. How are things today as compared with when you were growing up, when you were that age? And are these girls freer now to speak out? No, the freedom of speech of, for kids is still not there and I'm still struggling with it and it's not gonna be easy, but I'm gonna work on it. Um, when I was going to school, it was different because the teacher were trained and they were good at what they do. I still have great memory of my teachers. My pleasure of learning, reading, being curious come from the teacher that I had. And Benin used to be called the Latin Quarter of Africa because most of the post office guy, everybody that have higher rank job, they come from Benin, CEOs, everybody, because the, I mean, you see a Beninese guy, you know, you, I saw him then walking the street, I know, they look like intellectual all the time. It's just like, and they're too serious. <laughs> and <laughs> that's, that's what my, what one of the things that my husband realized. I mean, Beninese, they look too, too much like intellectual everywhere you go. I'm like, because the school at that time, the system was absolutely the best you can really think of. Then come the communist regime, and they kill everything. Within two years, it was gone. And it was the last year of my high school. And then university starts struggling, and I'm like, I ain't staying here. I'm not gonna stay here. First of all, as an artist, I could not use my music to praise the communism regime, and that was the thing that was imposed and asked, all artists. Secondly, what it does, that freedom of speech we have home, from one day to the other, is transformed to hell. You don't trust your father anymore, you don't trust your sister, you don't trust anybody, and they force you to call your mom and dad comrade. And I'm like, I'm not gonna stay here unless they put me in jail, I'm not gonna shut up. And my father's like, uh oh, you gotta leave. <laughs> so I left. The girls that I put to school today, the, the, this system that have been bro broken by the communist regime, we haven't been able to build it up till today. And when I started Batonga in 2006, the purpose of Batonga was a mother actually in Tanzania that told me, you campaign and ask us to put our kids to primary education. And you know very well that if they finish primary education and they're not going to secondary education, they're gonna end up in early marriage, they're gonna be mutilated, they're gonna start having pregnancy, how are you gonna help? 
And it coincided at the same time pretty much when Wangari Matai received her Nobel Peace mm -hmm. Prize. And I found out that she received, when she was a teenager, a scholarship for JFK Foundation. And she came to America and went back and become the environmentalist that we know today. And I said, that's the goal that I want to set up for my girls, for them to go to school, secondary education, to become something tomorrow. And I targeted the girls that come from the most poorest family background, HIV, AIDS, um, uh, orphans, disabled, extreme poverty. And I wanted a holistic, a holistic approach to it. Not only that we give scholarship, we give one meal a day. We give tutoring, we give uniform, we give books, and I have a mentor program that is really important to have, which are men and women that are the link between the child, the teacher, and the family. Something goes on, they are my ears and eyes on the ground, and they know that if a teacher raises the hand on my child, that teacher have 24 hours to disappear because I'm coming after him. That has been set as a rule because I don't want anybody to abuse physically or sexually my kids. I will not tolerate that. The problem we are having today is the problem every country is having in Africa pretty much. When the Millennium Development Goal have been set by the UN, the enrollment of kids to school went skyrocket. But no one thought about the quality of the education those kids are going to have. So you have kids that come to secondary education and they can't read or write properly. And it's something that is really worried, worries a lot, me a lot. When I was in Benin a couple of weeks ago, I met the president of Benin. Benin has been doing a lot. 26% of the budget of the country is in education. It's a lot for a poor country like mine. But it's not enough. So we have school of second chances where from the, for the kids that from 10 to 17 that drop out. We need to scale up the teacher training program. It costs money. And for me, I, be, I want, that's my, 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 my next fight with all these ministers of education in Africa. The curriculum have to change. The, girl, the kids today, girls and boys, what they are learning is just what they need to know to pass an exam. Nothing else, and it's not enough. So, one, one thing I want to ask you about, because this is you know, the connection between girls dropping out of school yeah. in Africa, all around the world, and poverty. I mean, it's taken so many years to come to this realization. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, thanks to people like yourself, who not only have a vision, but take kind of a leadership role and say, look, we've got a problem here. Mm -hmm. Girls are dropping out of school, they're getting pregnant, families are growing, poverty continues. Mm -hmm. um, you're also a musician, and you can walk into the president of Benin's office and have a conversation with him. Do you think that becoming a leader in the political realm would cancel out what you do in music? And what uh, does being a musician uh, give you? Do what is being an I artist? Don't, I don't want to do politics. But by walking into the office of the president, you because become a politician, I am, don't you? I am the voice of the one that have no voice. Those girls' parents hold me accountable. They cannot walk into his office, so I have to tell him. He can't sit there and say, I'm leading the country not knowing what's going on. That's, my, that's the thing that I said to all the African leaders. You, 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 you rule a country and you sit in your Mercedes, whatever it is. You don't go see the people that, I mean, come on. Who put you there? What is your role? I mean, everywhere, and it's not, it's not only in Africa. We are in a, in, a, in a time where democracy is in danger. Because the young kids of the rich country have no perspective of future. The same goes in Africa. So what do we end up doing? Do, do these politicians dismiss you? Because I remember going to Senegal <laughs> and, and some politicians were saying when Yusuf Ndour wanted to run for president, uh, you know, he can't run. He's, he, he's a musician. He's a griot. Yeah, but I mean, I, I'm an artist, man. What do you want me to do in politics? I'm going to be killed in two seconds because I'm going to tell you everything that American. I mean, you know me, man. If something is blue, you, can, you cannot force me to tell you that it's red. I will die over it. I don't care. So I can't do politics. I really can't do it because I can't sit around a table seeing people taking, making decisions that will impact the life of people for generations to come, knowing that that decision is bad and you want me to sign up for it? That's why I quit law school. Because I, I mean, it's just like crazy, man. I mean, I went to law school and I'm like, I want to be a lawyer of human rights. And then my, my law teacher said, okay, but you have to learn politics. I said, how come? And then he explained to me the link between human rights and I'm like, you think I'm going to put an innocent in jail because a, a country messed up? 
that president or minister, whatever it is, he's coming to my court and he's going to jail. And then he said, you can't do that. I said, ah, that's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it. So, so let's put you back on the stage as a performer, as a performer because the, the, the act of getting a message across to an audience. Mm -hmm. You don't want to write lyrics that are going to be you know, preachy. And you don't want to spend 10 minutes between every song explaining what it's all about. <laughs> Um, and yet you connect with an audience in a way that uh, you know, few performers are able to do. So what are, you, what are you doing that's different, that somehow connects in that humanity, that connects that message? Hmm. The thing is I never think about it. <laughs> I never think about it because when I started singing in my mom's theater group at six, I always used to hear my mom telling the actors and actresses, I don't want to hear about your headache on stage. I don't want to hear your husband is doing something wrong. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> you leave that in the dressing room because once you hit that stage, you have to be naked spiritually. It took me a lot of time to understand that. I'm like, huh? What does that mean? I'm not going on stage naked. <laughs> and my mom is, that's not that. You're going to get it. And one day it hits me because I used to be completely frozen before I go on stage. And then after a couple of songs in, I just get better. So one day I was doing a very important show in, in France, and as I was on the wing getting ready to go on stage, I hear the voice of my mother in my head. You have to be naked spiritually when you get on stage. And then suddenly felt like something have just, a weight just get lifted off my shoulder. And I'm like, I got it. Just be you. Be the truth. You can write music if you're not in the truth of that inspiration. And thank God we can't buy inspiration. You can't control it. You have it or you don't get it, period. So it's something you don't control. When the song comes to me, sometimes people say to me, you make up words. I say, that's the word that come first. Why do you want me to remove that? Like batonga, like boom, boom, I'm like, hey, that's what come. It comes, the song follow it. And people feel that truth. And you, you gotta always be in the truth and the light of what you do. You are not an artist without the public. You are a storyteller. Your story is somebody else's story because we are one human family. So if you come on stage and you go, hmm, I'm the star. I'm doing a favor being here. I'm like, sometimes I see some of my colleagues doing it. I'm like, for real? Are you for real? Really? What are you doing here? Get out. If you can't show me your guts, Please don't go on stage. It's like that great scene in uh, Walk the Line where the producer tells Johnny Cash, I want you to play me a song as if you're going to die. Exactly. What is the last song you're going to play exactly. before you die? Every song has to be like that. Yeah. If you yeah. don't have it in you, you can't give it, get the hell out of the stage. So one message that's really uh, been absolutely fantastic to watch that you've delivered is the connection between Africa and the New World. And you had the great trilogy with you know, touching on points in the US and uh, Brazil. Haiti, Cuba, um, what did you find that people actually got out of what you were saying about the African diaspora with those three albums? Well, that trilogy started again, once again, home. Okay, nine years old, rewind. I discovered slavery. I didn't understand anything about it. I'm like, oh, well. And then I turned 15. And we used to smuggle on TV to Ni of Nigeria because being in America, our TV was just like <laughs> a joke. You can't see nothing, it just blur all the time. So we have somebody on the roof of the house turning and we all be standing around going, no, no, on the left, no, right, come on, come on, right there, right there, right there, double. <laughs> and then you and as soon as we have the image, we all stare at the image. And that night, here comes for the first time ever I heard about apartheid. And Winnie Mandela was talking about Nelson Mandela and I was like, I look at the news and I turn around to my parents and say, how dare you be lying to me, telling me that a human being is not a matter of color, that we have to be open to everybody and this is happening. Now, I just lost my mind. I was so mad. I've never been mad like that ever. I was just so mad and I went in my room crying and I took my piece of paper and I started writing a song. The song came right there and the song is on the album I You Call As An Acme. My first draft was so hateful and I came out and started singing it my father looked at me, my father, uh -huh. he looked at me like that. And I finished the song, he said, you know you're not gonna sing that song right. I said, hell yeah, I'm recording it. And he said, no, 
I said, why not? He said, what did I tell you in this house? No hate, no violence. I understand how mad you are. I understand the pain, anything you want to express. Because I feel enraged as much as you are. But that doesn't give you the right as an artist to go on a rampage of hate, thinking that you're going to find a solution. When you're an artist, you are the one that holds the key to open locked doors. You are the one that builds bridges among people. If you can't do that, guess what? You're not going to sing in my house. So I went back and rewrite the song that becomes an anthem of peace, actually, where in that song I'm praying and hoping and dreaming that the day will come where there will be no more oppressors and no more oppressed people, that we all realize that if we hurt somebody, we're hurting ourselves. And from that point on, I turned around and told my father, or oh, I become a human rights lawyer, or I become a musician. My father said, whatever you decide to do, do it right. Learn it, be ex excellent in what you do. Don't take shortcut. My father don't like shortcut. You can't take shortcut. And I said, have you learned this first? Mm -mm, you can't jump there, you have to go back. <laughs> so that trilogy comes in my mind at that time. And when I decided in 1997 to move to America, my purpose was to write the song with white, black, Indian, whatever immigrant comes to this country to talk about this subject of slavery that is still under the rug for so many centuries right now. And the response was absolutely amazing because my, my, my publisher at that time was Warner Chapel, so he connected me with all the artists and we started writing the music. And so many things happened when I was doing Oren. Some artists that come in last minute, Kenny Kirkland, it was the last recording he did before he passed away. And I started realizing that this is an open wound that people are willing to talk about, but we are not doing it. So I did that, and then I went to Brazil, because the first port where the slave was sent to direct, if you put the map of the world together, you see Salvador de Bahia and my country, you put them together, they connect. So I went to Salvador de Bahia, and I, re I realized and discovered a lot of traditional music that I grew up in that the Portuguese were singing. Right. And I was like, huh? <laughs> Do you speak the language? They go. No, I'll not follow. I mean, yeah, okay, you don't follow, okay? <laughs> you don't speak the language, it's okay. You can sing in my language, as I take it. Yeah. And I learned a lot also about my own traditional music, how it goes around and come back with slave descendant and impacted the song of my ancestors. So it's always that call and answer of the traditional music of Africans that are the core of all the music people play today. Rock and roll have it. It does not matter what music you take that has no Africa in it, forget it. You dream, you just kidding <laughs> yourself. Um, so you said your father said, you're in this house, it's a freedom of speech zone, you can say anything you want. But then he said, no, you can't write that song. Yeah. So I, there's something that's been on my mind a lot lately, and that is something that happened ever since the attack on Charlie, Charlie. Hebdo mm -hmm. uh, in Paris. The, the sense of freedom of speech and whether it's absolute for artists. And I spent a lot of time in New York a couple of weeks ago talking to musicians who were there for Global Fest and at the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, um, just trying to get a sense of where is the balance between freedom of speech and the responsibility of acting decently in this new world we live in. So if you take France, for example, they're living in this post-colonial reality, um, mm -hmm. and they have a sense, a very strong sense of freedom of speech draw whatever we want, make fun of the Prophet Muhammad, it's all good. How do you see the balance between freedom of speech, freedom of expression, kind of playing out that same episode you went through with your dad? Mm -hmm. You can say whatever you want, but how do you, how do you strike that balance, especially well, in this day and age? You struck that balance by thinking first about yourself. You bring it always from yourself. If you don't like somebody to do something to you, don't do it to others, right? We can laugh about everything, but not with everybody. And I think that for me as an artist, what I've learned from that moment with my father is that I will never write anything that will trigger violence or hate. Because it's not my place to do that. And because I'm not here for that. I'm not a violent person and I don't want to. I can be hit up in the, in the moment of, of 
being mad, say some stupid thing, but deep down in my soul, I'm not a violent person. And I think that all this thing about Charlie is not about religion anymore. It's not about Mohammed. No, no. I mean, you read the Quran, there have been cartoonists in the Islam religion that have been critical of Mohammed. They haven't been beheaded, they haven't been killed. What is happening today is that we have extremist group that we are tying to Muslim religion. It's not the same thing. Not all Muslim people go around and kill people. So we are trying right now to put everybody in the same bag and it's a danger that they want, oh, those extremists, they are really smart. They want us to go on a hate rampage and it's dangerous, deadly, we can't go there. What I said as an artist, and I was um, as much critical of rap, rap act, artists that degraded women in their song, that praised violence. You degrade a woman in a, van, in, in a rap, you're degrading your mother. There are stuff that we know, our moral compasses have always to be at the center of what we do and be careful what we do. And I think that we really have to be careful not to give to those extremist group some legitimacy to kill for nothing. It comes with our moral compasses. We cannot have allies countries that beheaded this, their civilian and we go by and we stay quiet and where they behead an American person, we all go in rage. We got to, we're doing double standards for so long that it becomes something that enrages people more and more. We have the policy of saying, don't do what we do, do as we say, at the cost of your life. We can't do it anymore. We have pushed democracy out of the hand of the people and bring it to money. When you use so much money for a campaign, and in your country, you have billions of people with no job, and you can justify every dollar that you spend to be elected, and you can invest that dollar in getting a job to people, yeah. but there's something wrong with our democratic society. Yeah. So those, those extremist group, they are watching our contradiction all the wrong the way. And what we are doing, we are pushing people that are against this system into their hand. I cannot understand why an American young boy or young girl will go to ISIL. I don't understand it. Yet we never ask our question, the question, why, what make our youth so desperate that they would go to violence? We take the example of France. I was, I, I mean, I'm married to a Frenchman. I lived in France 14 years before I come here. Even if you hold a passport, a French passport, you're always African, you're always black, you're always from somewhere. Even if you are born third or fourth generation in France, you are not included in it. You look at the media, you look everywhere, you're black, you're Arabic, you cannot find a job, you cannot find a house. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, and suddenly it's, it becomes something that we ourselves have created by excluding people. I mean, we exclude people. I mean, America is the, the country of opportunity. The land of opportunities is here. I've been here since 1997, and I wouldn't have had the career that I have without this country. Because I was sick and tired of the French telling me, because you're African, you can't sing this, you can't talk like that, you can't do that. I'm like, you know what? Get the hell out of my life. I'm out of here. <laughs> Let's um, bring it back to uh, education and what you're doing now, um, because it is connected. I think of Malala, Malala Yousafzai, who is just such an impressive uh, woman her ability to speak up on behalf of all kids trying to get a fair education, mm -hmm. but especially uh, young girls. Um, and then you look at the state of education here in the United States. It's, you know, Malala was shot by the Taliban. The Taliban is still shooting up schools and still killing mm -hmm. kids who try to go to school. Absolutely. But you look at certain communities that are disenfranchised in the United States, and you find bad education in those communities too. So final question, where do you find the hope today when, you, when you're doing your fight for education. Where do you see hope? The hope is in the kids that we educated. Once they understand that education will give them a better future, then you have won the battle, a big one. The girls of Batonga, every time I go back, I'm just flabbergasted. They come from the most poorest family you can ever imagine. 
but give them the opportunity of a good education that's gonna transform their life and transform your society. It's proven today that when you educate a woman or a young girl, the GDP of your country rises up. And I think it's about time, us in America, we start doing right by the people. We, if we want this country to continue being the greatest country on the planet, we need social justice in education and sharing the wealth of this country more equally. If we do not do that, if we do not do that, as I'm American citizen that I am today, we will not be in security and safety nowhere in the world. And we have the means to do that. We just have to do it, we just have to listen to the American people. When people ask me, what can I do to help? I say, have you helped your neighbors yet? Have you helped members of your family yet? Have you done something in your community yet? Don't try to pity us in Africa, come and do it. Do it home first. If you have result home, then you can implement that example of a result in Africa. And if you come to Africa, please, one thing that I ask, and I've been talking about for, for as long as I live, is that don't pity us. Don't disrespect us. Don't dehumanize us. You can't come to Africa with a program and say, I have money to implement this. I don't care about what you think about it. Huh? Why have we been failing for 50 years? Because we don't, in, we don't have the human connection with the people. The emotional connection that it demands is more than having a, an NGO. It's more than having a billions of dollars of, of foundation. It asks your guts to be put on the table. To go to Africa is to sit on the ground with the mother and tell the mother, here I am at your service, what do you need? Your ego, you have to check it at the airport before you come to Africa. But people don't do that. So, until we realize, until we realize that in order for democracy to survive, in order for capitalism to thrive, we need to empower the people that participate in the economy we will lose everything, rich or poor, we are all losers. And I don't want that, I want winners. I'm in the game of the winners. It is always so inspiring to speak with you. Um, I wanna thank uh, Arts and Ideas for giving me this opportunity, not to hear myself speak, but to hand the microphone over to you because I think the more we hear from people like you, the more we hear from you, the greater likelihood things w will change. So I, hope I thank so. all of you for coming out. I, I congratulate really you thank on, you. The, on thank you, getting Michael. this award. <laughs> and uh, have a good afternoon. And don't miss her on June 21st, because if you haven't seen Angelique, it's about time you did. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, we yeah, are both in the music, music. <laughs> and then we're back in the hall. The mistake that everybody... <laughs> oh, that's a normal... <laughs> we messed it up. <laughs> Before we let him off the stage, I want to thank Marco Orman for bringing Angelique to us in such a special way. Marco, thank you very much. Very well. Marco, Marco. Angelique. <laughs> what a great place. Really gorgeous. I'm keeping it and I'm taking it home. <laughs> Don't even think about keeping it. I'm just telling. Which way does it turn? You got it right. I want to quote from I want to quote from page four or five of our program, defining the Visionary Leadership Award that is presented annually to a person whose trailblazing work is impacting the world. I think we understand that from Angelique's music, from her dedication to the people around the world. So on behalf of all the people that you've touched, especially those of us in this room and the Festival of Arts and Ideas, we want to present you as our fifth annual Visionary Leadership Award. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Congratulations. Wow. Now we got our Thank you. All right, we're coming. We're coming to the lights. All right. Thank you. Can you hold this for me just a second? Enough of speeches. I'm gonna sing a song for you. There is a song that we used to sing in Benin and Togo, which is a thanking and a blessing song at the same time. 
Because we believe that when you leave your worries, you leave your work, and you come and spend time with people and talk to people, it's normal that we thank you and bless you back safely home. And this song is about thanking each one of you, the partner of Art and Idea Festival, everybody in this place, New Haven. I met the mayor of New Haven. New Haven is in a place where it can become what the American society of the future going to be. How do we live together, not only on the campus, but outside of the campus? How can we empower every single citizen of New Haven to be part of Yale? And how Yale can create and educate the new leaders that will transform America and the world? And I think that is the challenge before you. And I know deep down in my guts, in my heart, that you will succeed because there are very good brains in this room thinking about it before I even start talking about it. So I encourage you, Mayor, to do what you're doing. And as I said before, if you need, need me, just hollow. I'll be right there. So I will sing for you now. Blow away. Blow away. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and if not before, we'll see you in June it's on the green. Too. You should, you deserve it. Oh, I'm you gonna put it anyway. <laughs> I'm gonna go first so I can see what's inscribed on the back. 